Alright, hi everyone. Um, welcome back to uh, Strategy q a with uh, me, Emmanuel, uh, from Acolyte Coaching. Uh, this um, uh, video is uh, pre-recorded, uh, but if you have uh, questions, uh, you can just pop into the, the co uh, comments or question box, and I will be standing behind the uh, screen and um, answer appropriate uh, question uh, the question accordingly. Now, I have with me here is the uh, managing director of Blue Ocean Strategy Australia, uh, Mr. Andrew Nelson. He's here with me to talk about. Uh, strategic planning. How are you, Andrew? I'm good. Thanks. Thanks for asking me here, Emmanuel. It's good. It's good to be here. Now, uh, I should just say we're, we're going to be. We've got these laptops in our hands because we're going to be doing some demonstrations, yeah, some yeah. software, that sort of stuff. So, excuse the the laptops <laughs> in between us. <laughs> so we're not promoting Dell or. <laughs> <that's> uh, <what laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, you you might decide to get some uh, revenue out of it, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah. So, um, just before we get into this, um, how long have you been doing this, Andrew? Uh, well, actually, Blue Ocean Strategy nine years. Nine years yesterday. Wow, congratulations, <laughs> happy birthday for Australia. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, so nine years and we've, we've got uh, a license from the professor. So if you've read the book, or a lot of people may have read the book or seen, read some of the articles or that sort of stuff, um, uh, read the books, there's two of them. Um, the professors have licensed organisations around the world right. to uh, provide B2B consulting and we've had that uh, licence here in Australia for, uh, for nine years effectively. So, right. yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's good. Now let's let's dig right into it. Okay, Andrew, why do we need strategic planning now? Okay, I think strategic planning right now is is really important because of the state of the economy, and not just in Australia but around the world. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, if anybody's seen it, there, there was an article written in The Economist magazine back in January call, and it was all about slobalisation. Slobalisation. Love that. And um, uh, you know, we can put these cutesy terms on it, but it's serious. Um, it's a phrase that was coined by um, a, a Spanish uh, uh, sort of trend watcher a few years ago. But basically what he's saying, if you look at, look at where we are, and there's a lot of countries that are in similar, slightly different mixes of these. But you look at Australia, we've got uh, interest rates approaching zero. Mm. Right? So we've got very little monetary stimulus coming into the, into the, the economy. We've got the government um, adamant that it's, it uh, wants to stimulate the economy, but it doesn't want to threaten uh, a surplus, you know, uh, mm. you know, it doesn't want to go into deficit. Uh, it's got a surplus hopefully being promised in the next year or so, and it doesn't want to give that up. So it's not going to do a lot in terms of uh, fiscal stimulus. They will be looking at things like structural reform, so in the economy, that's fine, that might drive some productivity. Mm. Um, uh, so then, then we've, got our, we've got no wages growth, uh, really low wages growth. Our unemployment is starting to just tick up just a little bit. Mm. So, so money's not being pumped in through wages growth. We've actually got underemployment, so when people do get extra hours, that's not pushing up wages either, mm. and it's generally going to pay off uh, debt and those sort of things, mm. or just absolute, you know, essentials. Um, and we've got our major trading partners, the US, Japan, and China. Now, the US and, J and, and China are in a trade war, uh, which is which has now become a currency war. Yeah. Um, and Japan is not a great economy either, right? Mm. Right now, it's it's the same. It's got like one percent growth rate. Um, you put all that together, what have I missed out? Inflation, you know, but, but you yeah. put all that together and basically yeah. with this, there is, you tell me where growth is going to come from. And there's a lot of industries right now that are actually in deflation. They've got negative inflation. Um, retail, um, I think transport, communications, is a whole, if you drill into the, uh, the uh, inflation figures, you've got all these industries that are also in deflation. So the bottom line is, if you're not worried about growth, that's okay, because you, you, you're not going to get any. Uh, because, but if, you, if you're still looking to try and find and figure out where can I put growth back into my yeah. business, or at least where can that growth come in so that it's, it's at least um, making up for any losses that I make. You know? mm -hmm. So where's that growth going to come from? The only place you're going to get growth is to convince people to spend money differently, mm -hmm. to shift their spending from another adjacent industry or something like that. That takes strategy. Yeah. So, so that that's why I think strategic planning is really important because we're going to get be in this slow growth environment. And and some of the economists have been saying we're looking at you know low interest rates for the next six seven years. Yeah. So that's yep. that's the that's the background. Okay. That's why why yep. strategic planning is so important right now because you need to figure out where you're going to spend your time and effort because you're yep. going to have this flat line. Now let me uh, drill deeper, um, and this is what I've been uh, talking to when whenever I meet I meet people in networking. 
uh, and now to get to hear it firsthand from um, Andrew himself, why Blue Ocean Strategy? Okay, why Blue Ocean Strategy? Now, so Blue Ocean Strategy specifically looks at growing new markets and generating demand in those markets. So w what it's basically doing is you have you have two forms of sort of disruption, disruption Uber and you know etc. Et but some of that is destructive disruption. It actually replaces one industry with another. Destroys. And that's, well, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Or, or it certainly displaces certain amount of the revenue, et cetera, moves into new, new space. So that's one way of creating a blue ocean, right? To get people to move their spending from an existing industry into your version of the industry. Another way is to be more creative. And a perfect example of that is things like um, the boom in, in personal coaching, personal training, and all that sort of stuff. It hasn't replaced anything. Another one we like to joke about is Viagra. You know, Viagra didn't replace anything. It didn't shift yeah. money spending from anything else. It created a whole new industry, a whole new market. Personal coaching, training, all that sort of stuff did, did the same thing. It created a whole new market. Yeah. So, so that's what you want with Blue Ocean. You want to actually create a whole new market where uh, it's attracting people spending away from other things uh, in, into this alternative space that, you, yeah. that you've established and you, you own. Yeah. Um, that, that's why. It's, it's a bit more, I wouldn't say it's, it's completely monopolistic, but it's a bit more not monopolistic mm. because you've got a space that you own for a period of time. Right. It's not a natural monopoly that no one will ever copy it again uh, from, from then on, but people are going to come into that space yeah. um, eventually. Now, the, the reason I, I brought you here, um, I'd like to showcase um, what we do uh, with our clients, uh, Andrew. Sure. So if you can, uh, is there something that you can show uh, to I, us? I, I do. Um, it, what I also want to say though, uh, can, I, can I just pick up on a sure. little bit more? There's another reason for, for Blue Ocean Strategy. There, there are other strategic planning methods, and I'm not saying don't use them, yeah. but you get different things from different methods. Right? Mm. So, so when you're in this sort of situation where there's low growth, slow growth, no growth, um, you end up with things like price wars and all this sort of mm. stuff, right? And so, so what a lot of businesses then do is move towards things like vertical and horizontal integration. They figure out, okay, the space I'm in now, uh, it's really tight, so the best thing I can do is maybe take out some of the com competitors. I can mm. buy out, merge, you know, acquire some of the competitors. If I can't put them out of business completely and just take yep. the customers, yep. right? Mm. So that's, that's one. The, the other is to go vertical and say, okay, um, I'll give you an, an example, you know, um, agriculture is a good one that people, people understand. If I'm a pig farmer and suddenly pig farming is not profitable anymore, mm -hmm. right? But I might decide, okay, well, you know, the pig farm is not profitable, but having a butcher is, is profitable. Mm -hmm. so, so maybe I can still lose money on having the pig farm, but I'll buy an abattoir and I'll mm -hmm. buy, uh, if you're big enough, obviously you buy an abattoir, so you do the vertical integration. So I'll buy the feedlot, I'll buy the, uh, uh, keep the pig farm. I can lose money on certain aspects because the profit making has shifted to another part in the, indus in the industry, another mm -hmm. space in the industry. So that's that vertical integration. So that's another thing people tend to rush off and do and say, okay, how can I yep. move up and down the supply yep. chain? Um, the other thing that people then to do, start to do is some of the analysis like pestle analysis. You know, what's the, what's the you know, social, economic, uh, you know, environmental, legal, you know, uh, you know uh, technological trends, etc. Yeah. That doesn't necessarily give you much idea of, it tells you where the industry's at. It's like five forces. Yeah. You know, mm. um, it doesn't tell you any more than you sort of almost already know. Mm. It doesn't give you any new insights as such. It just describes the situation. Mm. So, so the reason the Blue Ocean is, is relevant is because we use these things called the six paths to innovation, mm. which actually helps you identify what you can tweak, what you can do. Where you can move into. That's yeah. right. Mm. What you can actually change, what the levers that you, you have to actually move. Mm. And so I won't go into all of those, but basically what we end up with from that is, is four things that we can tweak. We can eliminate or reduce things, mm -hmm. cut things out, save money, do stuff that customers don't, take off away things that customers don't care about anymore. And we can reinvest in the stuff that shifts the, to the new blue ocean market, create stuff or, or raise the bar on stuff that customers really actually value, but yep. maybe haven't been getting. Yep. So it becomes this formula of eliminate, reduce, mm -hmm raise and create. So, so um, that's the difference with Blue Ocean. It actually gives you this model for figuring out what it is you're going to change, not just describing the situation. Yeah. 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 
Okay. Um, so that's really it's pretty cool. And w the reason I wanted to show these tools is because they this is the this is the stuff that we actually work through with organisations. We don't have the solution, you know. Mm. We don't have the end, you know, answer. Mm. What we do is we facilitate uh, teams, usually quite diverse teams from an organisation, to get them to rethink the industry do some research, come back, capture it, yeah. and decide what needs to change. And just to clarify, this is not um, an hour or two hour engagement. Yeah, we go over like sometimes it's years. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, it typically takes organizations a good three or four months of That's elapsed it. time, you know, not talking about three or four months of working full time on this, elapsed yeah. time, hmm. while people think things through, go out and test things in the market, come back and say, look, I really learned this now. I found some insights into these customers. And we, we typically do that by, Asking the questions, who are the non-customers? Mm. Who are the people that the industry is not engaging with, that we're not attracting their dollars, their yeah. spend? Yeah. And then the question is why? And go out and test it. And what you'll find is that people have these fixed views about what people will and won't spend their money on. Mm. Um, you know, look, it's like the Dyson vacuum cleaner is a beautiful one of those. You know, who yeah. would have ever said, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna yeah. create this vacuum cleaner and it's gonna cost $700. <laughs> You know, and I'm going to get 30% or 20% of the market. Unthinkable back, back then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unth you know, but, but he, he solved the problem that the others weren't That's solving, it. which is it actually cleans. It <laughs> actually does a, you know, a great job. So, so you know, it, but it broke the model of, you know, what, yeah. do you, what does a good vacuum cleaner cost and what does it look like and what does it do? And there's, there's a lot of things that we do in, um, with, with clients as well. We challenge the, uh, the, the mindset, what's, the, yeah. the, what's taken for granted. Yeah, in that's right. Yeah. And that takes time because people have got these fixed views that's and they've it. got to rethink things and think, well, actually we've tested it with customers and they told us this and actually it does mm. work and you know. So that's why I'm saying it takes a good three or four months because you yeah. typically need to go out and do a bit of testing and validating and that sort of yeah. stuff. That's um, good. Yeah. Now, the, the studio, well, I wanted to show you the, the tools that we yep. use and I've, I've, I've put together one as a sort of an example. Yep. So if we can we switch to that, sure. I'll, show, I'll talk you through it. So what I've got here to begin with is is just like a five-step stage or you know uh, program that we have, which is it's just to keep people because we're talking to people over three or four months typically, mm. um, they need to know where they are in the process. And we talk about getting started, getting the team ready, getting them all on the same page, then understanding where we are now, imagining where we want to be. This is where we're going to ideation mm. and the options and ideas, then figuring out how to get there, validating it, understanding which you know, what we need to put in place to change either things in terms of the organization, the product, the service, but engaging with customers, yeah. and then make your move. Once you've planned all that, get it. So it's logical, there's nothing yep. radical about yep. that, but it's good for people to understand where they are, the roadmap, hmm. it's the roadmap. Hmm. Now what I've done is I've put together a project here. So this is the tools that we actually give people access to this whole system. And I, yep. I won't show you down here because it has the names of my clients. But <laughs> what I will, I'll, if I click into here, it takes you into this one that I've produced, which is uh, for Cirque du Soleil, which right. people often think about Cirque du Soleil yeah. with, with Blue Ocean Now, um, just for those of you in the audience who hasn't read the book for some reason, uh, Cirque du Soleil is one of the uh, classic case study break from the 80s where uh, a circus is typically very uh, red ocean, very congested. Uh, and uh, basically what we're doing here is just uh, do, uh, do a, a a studio representation of the, the case study. Yeah, that's right. So what we're going to show, so if you if anyone knows Cirque du Soleil, one of their first um, shows, in fact, was a thing called, a show called We Reinvent, Reinvent the Circus. That's right. And so if anybody's seen Cirque du Soleil before, if you go Google it and watch some of the videos, etc., you'll see it it does not look like a circus. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Um, but the interesting thing is it came from, it was invented effectively by some, st some uh, street performers performance, who yeah. were acrobats and jugglers, all mm. that sort of stuff coming from the, the culture, if you like, mm. and the history of the, of the circus. So what I've, what I've done here is I'm gonna show you one of the key tools that we start mm. off with. And I've sort of cheated a little bit because I've yeah. sort of into that one tool, I've got the start and the end. I don't know if you can just give a one sentence explanation, just go through yeah. the, the individual uh, tools, what, what they are. Yeah, so these tools are in, a, in an order that helps you find your blue ocean effectively. Mm. What we do is we first, the first one is called an as is strategy canvas and basically I'll, I'll give you a good example of this, but what we do is we map the industry as it is now, what we think 
the industry is valuing putting uh, effort into to win customers mm. um, and questioning that. Then we go to a buy utility map and that is where we start to look at the pain points that the industry has created mm. or, the, or the things that they haven't solved. Mm. Um, so the, the issues that the industry is just glossing over which customers look at and it turns them off. That's why they don't do, they don't do the final And buy. sometimes we talk about a pleasure point as well. Not yeah, we, yeah, we point. do. Because yeah. some, sometimes you've got some people in the industry who've solved it, mm. but the rest of the industry haven't. Yeah. So particularly businesses that are coming to us looking for their blue ocean, they've usually found one or two little things and mm. think we think we've solved it, but they don't necessarily see it in the whole context. And they say, well, we've solved one or two problems, but that's mm. not, you know, it's not big enough or it's not enough yeah. for the customers to come yet. You need to yeah. build it out with other things. The, the next thing we do is we look at tiers of non-customers. Who are those people who are not buying? Yeah. And this is where it starts to get a bit reiterative. We might go backwards and forwards a little bit between pain points for which non-customers. Mm. But the whole idea here is to generate ideas. Mm. between the, the, It's the interaction between looking at the strategy canvas, how the industry competes now, the pain points, and the non-customers and what they're looking mm. for. That starts to create this... Um, or generate ideas from people when they start to put all those pieces together. Yep. Then on top of that, then we put the six paths in. And the six paths identifies areas that we can move and things that we can change. An example is, for example, complementary products and services. Yes, one of the uh, six paths. Yeah. yeah, one of those is, is what are the products and services that are used before, during and after your product yeah. that are either creating a, uh, sorry, creating a pain point or um, or could be better into integrated and and make more of a pleasure point for mm. customers. Mm. Um, another one, for example, is every product, usually product or service, usually has buyers and end users and influencers. Mm. Um, now, the same people might play all of those roles, mm. but the question is, why aren't the influencers, for example, influencing enough for yes. us? Yeah. Uh, what are the pain points have the, that we've created for the influencers? and how do we solve those. Yeah, yeah. So those six paths helps us generate more ideas in terms of what we can we can change. And from that, we typically end up with a short list. We, we end up usually with a long list, but we pair that back to a short list of things that we're convinced once we've tested in the market, mm -hmm. what we can eliminate, reduce, raise, and create. That's that ERRC, mm -hmm. eliminate, reduce, raise, and create. And once we put those four, you know, the, the mix of those four actions in place, mm. then you've got your to be strategy yeah. canvas. What, is, what does it look like now? Uh, okay. Let me uh, drill down into the ERRC before you go into the, the as is strategy canvas uh, deeper. Um, a, a lot of time, be, uh, companies are really uh, they really want to create something new, something unique, and. Um, but when we engage with clients, we always um, encourage them to uh, figure out what can you eliminate, what can you reduce. If you can explain more why that's also important as, uh, as opposed to just creating new stuff. Oh, oh look, it's, it's, um, it's to be competitive, um, you have to be cost competitive as well. Mm. So what you find is um, a lot of businesses just keep adding bells and whistles. They just mm. keep adding on something extra, something more. It's confusing for customers sometimes. Uh, too much choice, things that they don't need, all that sort of stuff, and they tend to want to keep in uh, business. Tend to want to mm. keep in things that are redundant, stuff that customers don't need anymore, mm. or don't value, or they think that the customer values, but they haven't really tested it. And so there's a lot of waste going on. So, so what we found is the businesses that truly create value innovation, innovation for the customers, is that they eliminate the things that are meaningless or yep. less worthwhile for the customers. It gives them the opportunity to invest in the things yep. that are more important for customers. So you've got to have both. Otherwise, you, if you just do one, you're just stripping things out and you're not creating any more value. Mm. And if you just to try and do the extra bills and whistles, then you're loading your business up with costs yep. and yep. confusion for the customers. Cool. So you need those both at the same yeah. time. Yeah. So uh, I think for the sake of time, we'll just drill down to um, just the, the first one, the as is strategy canvas. And by, by all means, this is not the uh, the most important. Well, maybe it, it is somewhat. It's the, a starting point. It's a starting point. It's yeah. a start, in a way, it's a starting and end, end point. Yeah. yeah. Um, the rest of the stuff is how you get there. That's right. That's right. Okay. So I'll explain. That, so mm. I'm going to open this up. This is a strategy canvas that we put together for. Um, mm. Oh, actually, I've gone to the wrong one. I have to, I have to apologize. This is the one. Um, to for the Cirque du Soleil compared to yep. the large typical circus, yep. right? Now, if you think this is back in the days, yeah. No. So this yep. is this is if you go back, it's not even not that far away, but 20, 30 years ago, yep. but certainly thirty years ago, um, but you still see some circuses now, but they've they've become the boutique 
sort of mm. exotic, you know, not, you know um, rarity. They're almost the, it's like looking at a rare, rare antique car now. <laughs> you know, it's almost like that. They have a place. Sorry, they, put it. <laughs> they have a place, they have yeah, a place, yeah. but they're, they're, not like, they're, they're not like they used to be. There's not the, the number of them anymore. They're, they're now just a small, small group. Yeah. But what actually, the, the way the, the large circuses, you'll see here we've drawn this, this curve for the large circuses, and we've put it down here, all of the factors that the industry competed on. Mm. And essentially, they, they basically had a very low price because they were targeted at families. Um, they had star performers, a acrobats, uh, you know, uh, jugglers, all that sort of stuff. Mm. They had lots of animal shows. There's also lots of, um, you know, the lions, the tigers, the elephants, the, et cetera, the, the, the show ponies, all that yeah. sort of stuff, right? Um, oil concessions, that's an American term, but basically this is selling, selling popcorn. Right, you know, all that right. sort of stuff that you sell up and down the aisles, yeah. peanuts, popcorn, ice yeah. creams, et cetera, drinks, yeah. et cetera, to make some money. Um, uh, they had multiple arenas, so in a way, what they were trying to do is create a spectacular, but you couldn't watch everything that was going on because they were on three arenas at the same time. <laughs> so it was yeah. actually confusing for customers as well. Uh, a lot of fun and humour, which is why people actually went, in, yeah. in fact. A bit of thrills and danger as well. Um, but then, you know, it wasn't exactly, it was a sort of a unique environment because it was, uh, you know, the circus, the, circus, the, yeah. the, the, the um, the uh, the tent and all that yeah. sort of stuff, but you're usually on pretty crap chairs, uh, <laughs> sawdust around, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So not an inviting, mm. but fine for kids and family yeah. that sort of stuff, yeah. right? But there was no theme to it as such. You'd have all these three these shows, and each one was its own sort of thrill spill excitement or whatever. But mm. each one was a distinct little show, right? There also wasn't this sort of refined environment mm. or a sales, and there wasn't any sort of um, it, it was the one show that was on with the one circus, yep. and that circus had to travel around and take the show with it. Mm -hmm. um, and there wasn't any spe anything spectacular in terms of artistry or music or dance with it. You flip that to Cirque du Soleil, and what they've done is they've realised, you know what, we don't need star performers, we don't need animals, these are all just expenses. Mm. Um, we don't need to sell popcorn, but what we could sell up the end here is is champagne and uh, and mm. uh, DVDs, etc. Right? Yeah. Um, we don't need multiple arenas. Yeah. Uh, what we need is one spectacular show that's got a lot of artistry and music and themes, mm. etc. So, so they've they've sort of borrowed more up here from opera and theatre, mm. a theme, great music. Uh, uh, the sh a, a production that they can actually put on in Las Vegas and London and, and uh, Sydney at the same time. Um, so they've just changed the business model completely. So uh, they've rethought the business model. Uh, and uh, if, I, if I go to another one that I drew here, this is one mm. comparing it to the opera. And again, they've sort of borrowed some stuff from the opera, but they're very different from the opera as well. Mm. So I'm just using that example of what we do is we get our clients to think this stuff through and say, what can we borrow from other industries that doesn't exist right now in our industry? Right. What can we eliminate, reduce that will save costs and those sort of things? Mm. So. What a lot of our clients end up with is a, is a graph that's very much like this, and they often actually even build this into their sales and marketing. Mm. So they can clearly demonstrate to customers, normally you're paying for all this stuff, but you don't really value it. And yet yeah. down here is the stuff that you would really find valuable, but it's not being provided by the mm. industry, and that's what we focus on. Let me ask you something. Um, uh, we, now, we now know that uh, audience hate multiple arenas in, in this case. Yeah. Um, and yet, that's been the practice for so long. And h how do businesses uh, avoid making the same mistakes? Yeah, yeah. Look, uh, that's a that's a great example because um, effectively, what people have to realise is uh, they need to look at where these other models have been successful. So mm -hmm. one of the things we ex we ask people to look at is alternative industries. Right. So the, the, the three ring circus is a perfect example. I say, well, circuses always have three rings. That's right. And you say, well, that's fine, but what, what if we look at some of the other models, like the opera, like the theatre, where there is just one stage, mm -hmm. and all the focus is on the, that single stage, mm -hmm. because you're not, in a way, worried that you've put something on that people won't like, or that they need something else to watch. 
So you need to just get um, the people in the industry to rethink it, but look for other examples where they can say, that's what we're trying to replicate. Mm. We're going to borrow that model from that industry and bring it into our industry mm. and test that. Mm. Yeah. So, so it's not completely... It's not completely about um, moving to something that has been completely untested. Mm. Often, often it's about saying, where else, who else has solved this problem in, in a way before? Can we? What can we learn from them and bring that into our industry? Right. That's innovation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So at one point, these businesses start to uh, need to start looking into the things that they've they've done and the way they do things and realize uh, that that can be better. I mean. That it can be different. They can be different. Yeah. Uh, if you think about the the uh, again the, the multiple arenas things, I think people should have realized that uh, audiences ha hates and at one point they they should start uh, re retrospect themselves and say, hey, people don't really. Well, enjoy it was it. a point of difference because the, the the small regional circuses didn't have that. They only had they didn't have the the space right. for it. The but the big ones thought, oh, this is a point of difference for us. We've got so much going on. We mm -hmm. can, but but in actual fact, it was was huge cost. Yeah. Um, there was an element of uh, we wanted to do that because that way the customer would always be close to something of, that was going on. Mm -hmm. They might not see the things happening in Ring Three if they're yeah. sitting at Ring One, That's right? That's so it. so. In a way, they were also they were creating these different pain points. I wanted to see what was going up there, but I couldn't mm. see it from my seat. So, in a way, they were trying to solve some problems and make mm. it more interesting and more exciting, and more and differentiated, but creating other problems in the process. Mm -hmm. um, so, in a way, that actually raises something. With, I'll, I'll go to some of these other tools because sure. because what we do is we that that strategy canvas is one of the tools. Another one of the tools we look at is pain points. Mm. And even with a new product or a new service, we still have to look back at it and say, okay, even if this solves some pain points, mm -hmm. what are the new ones it's creating? Does right. it create any new? It's yeah. like, um, you know, cars solved a lot of pain points around horses, but yeah. they come with their own problems. That's it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's the same sort of thing. You've got to look at what those pain points are that yeah. you've created and whether they're causing, uh, you know, whether they're going to cause a, an obstacle. Yeah. Um, it's like the Segway. People talk about that Segway, the thing that yeah. you sit on a stand, and it solves a lot of problems. But the problem, but you've got to find some place to park it, yeah. and, and you look like Charge an idiot. It. You look like an idiot on it. <laughs> oh, sorry for people who say Segway drive, but, but yeah, it looks a bit silly. You feel really self-conscious on it, yeah, right? Yeah. And uh, so, so it created new pain points yeah. that meant a lot of people would not take it. Not to mention uh, the learning curve. Uh, to, yeah, uh, that's right. To, that's right. That's right. To, that's right. To, yeah. So, so look, the pain points is an important thing because it opens people's eyes to what mm. can be changed and what should be changed. Mm. It doesn't necessarily mean that we change everything that we identify as a pain point, yeah. but we are, we try and prioritise those and say what's the stuff that really makes a difference mm. to customers. We talked about the n the non customers and we look at. Um, in fact, with this, we look at different types of or tiers of non-customers. We, right. we talk about soon-to-be non-customers, people who are soon leaving the industry or no longer repurchasing mm. and why and what can we do to retain those people. We look at people who are refusing or rejecting and why are they mm. rejecting. And then we look at people who just haven't even thought of using our products or services. So let me uh, ask further question because this is something that I... Uh, only learn when I become a Blue Ocean Strategy uh, consultant. Uh, and all along, uh, what we're trying to do is to how to train to get clients to know, to understand their niche market, their target market. Uh, but here we're talking about who are your non customer, who's not buying from you. Yeah. And why is that present more opportunity than focusing on the, the, your current market? Okay, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, um, if you are working with a, with a niche of customers, mm. um, that can be really profitable, but it's also highly risky mm. because that niche has all sorts of demographics attached to it in terms of why they are who they are. And if those demographics start to change, then you lose, your, your, your niche tends to shrink or, mm. or get disrupted, etc. What we look at is commonalities across all these different niches, if you like. We say, mm. we say don't look at niches and, and try and target a niche. Look for all of the potential buyers that could buy your product and look mm. for the commonalities across them all. Mm. Because that's how you create a big ocean instead of operating a little puddle. Yeah. Um, you've suddenly opened up your business to 
all a, a much broader uh, group of potential customers because you're solving a problem that is common to this large group mm. instead of solving a problem that is targeted at a small niche. Mm. Uh, and and it's, it's almost completely the opposite of the way most marketing people have been taught exactly. in, at university for the last umpteen years because they've been taught to to be granular and get down into the deep, mm. you know, the roots of you know what segments, uh, separate customers. Can we talk to those individual issues yep. around those? So yeah, yep. We try and say what's the commonality because you can, there's a common problem across a bigger group. You've got a big pool to, to yep. grab. Yeah, okay. and I think to take um, example of the Cirque du Soleil, who are their non-customers? Okay, so if you think about the tra traditional, work. yeah, work. traditional uh, circle, uh, circus industry, it was it was typically families. Mm. You know, pe parents would take their kids along, um, but um, they're typically also um, price sensitive, right? Yeah. So it would typically be uh, you know, a, a, you know, yeah, it might be a treat and all that sort of stuff, but mm. typically they would be looking for you know something that's low cost. Um, but Cirque du Soleil, because they turned it into an art form. They turn it in, into something that has has more artistic uh, value, etc. The price is more like a, a seat at the opera or the theatre, yeah. like three, four hundred dollars, you know, etc. Um, and uh, and also their target market changed because you're typically not taking the kids along to see uh, Cirque du Soleil. You're taking your business colleagues That's or your it. customer, your, your clients. Could along be as an incentive or reward. Those sort of yeah. things, or you're taking, you know, uh, you know, you're going with uh, with your your, your partner or, or some friends, etc. Mm. It's a much more of a luxurious event, all that sort of stuff. So they shifted mm. into a completely different group of, of uh, customers mm. away from the family. Uh, so that created this whole. But they've. They, they've Solved um, the, or found this common opportunity for a new type of entertainment mm. that appeals to that huge group of people who've got huge um, uh, disposable income to spend. Yeah, yeah. So more money. Yeah, that's, for, that's right. It's a bigger pool. Bigger pool. <laughs> bigger pool. Bigger pool of people yeah. and a bigger pool of dollars. Cool. Yeah. So, um, what's the next? Um, uh, the other thing we, we look at is the six paths. Yeah. We talked a little bit about that to generate ideas, yeah. uh, and then from all of that, we start to, inst you know, with all of that, that's gathering this information, and you get this divergent thinking, all of the possible things we could do, and then we look at doing convergent thinking. We bring it, bear it, pack it pair it back to well, that. Okay, we've got a million options, but um, what, what's the ten or twenty mm. or whatever it is things that are really important to this business? Um, so into these customers, so so that's where we pair it back, and that's what we, we use the uh, ERC for mm. the eliminate, reduce, raise, create, because yeah, yeah. we basically set then four actions, yeah, yeah. and what that means that becomes your action plan. It becomes your how what you actually yeah. implement, um, and that's often a problem with strategy. People have these strategy documents prepared, but it, and they talk about what's happening and what our strategy is, but to operationalize the strategy. Yeah. You need something like this that actually says, well, what are the actual actions? Yeah. What are we actually taking to eliminate, reduce, raise, create? And that way also, it makes it clearer for people who are just working on one aspect of that mm. to understand how their piece fits into the bigger yeah. picture. Yeah. Um, so even if you've got, I don't know, a communications person who's working on the messaging for a new product or whatever, they see that now in the whole context of what's being eliminated, reduced, raised, mm. created, and so they understand they're part of a bigger whole. They yep. understand the whole strategy. They're not just looking, you know, myopically or narrow vision around the yeah. one aspect that they're doing. They see it as part of the big picture. And the fact that um, a lot of our tools are visuals is, is makes it even easier to That's true. communicate that to the uh, um, to the team. That's true. So if I, um, if we can go back, uh, you mentioned about uh, convergence and divergence, and I just probably before we um, wrap up. Um, can can you explain? Uh, I don't know if you if you can click go back to the uh, uh, the as is. Yeah. How do we work around the concept of convergence and, and divergence? Which one is a blue ocean, and how diverge a curve needs to be uh, before okay. we actually find a true blue ocean? Okay. Um. Look, the 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 interesting thing about going through this exercise is often you find things that are just better competition in the red ocean. <laughs> Things that we can just do better, that we should just do better anyway. Mm. Often, I'll be honest, often we're finding things that businesses will say, oh, we thought of that two years ago and we still haven't done it. 
And it's just, this actually brings that impetus. So we're, we're crazy not to do it. We've got to do it. Yeah. So, so sometimes the first quick wins are usually things that have just been sitting in the business and just haven't had the impetus. Yeah. Um, and this puts, it, puts those into light in terms of saying, now I get why we didn't do it because it was just one aspect of that. Mm. It was just an eliminator, it was just a create. Yeah. It yeah. was once, but once you put in the whole context, then you start to realize, oh, okay, this makes much more of a stru- holistic strategic sense mm. rather than a tactical move. Right, right. right. Mm. So, so to answer your question, the, the blue ocean comes from when you've got a big enough pool of people of, with a common problem and you can see that what you've done in terms of eliminate, reduce, raise, create speaks to that group. Mm. So we talk about divergent, compelling. Um, uh, so we, we look, look at, is it, we talk about focused divergent, compelling. Is it focused in terms of we're clear what we're doing, mm. but is it different from what is else, else is out there into divergent? And yeah. does it have a compelling story? Do we, are we clear why Take people one are saying to us that yes this this solves that problem for me yeah or does that you know for me that nothing else does yeah. um that's what we look for focus divergence and compelling yeah that's good i think um, i want to go forever with with these things because um, this is <laughs> this is why we enjoy uh doing what we do uh in this and you know i mean i can i can talk for days about yeah. this stuff and, I, and i'm sorry if i spoke very quickly but, <laughs> I, but I, uh, there there is so much to this that yeah people get out of it in terms of rethinking what they're doing and stopping just compla- playing that game that the other players set. Yep. You, you know, typically it's the, the big players in the industry that set the rules and they will determine what these factors are mm. and you'll think that you've got to copy those. Yeah, yeah. You think you you think you need the three rings yeah. and you think that you need the icons and you think that you need the star performers and the animals. But as soon as someone opens your eyes and says, you know what, you don't need any of those. What you really need is a show that has a theme. A theme and you can yeah. charge two, three times as much yeah. for that for something that has uh, some artistic merit. Yeah, um, yeah. Switch it on its head. That's the thing. You stop playing by somebody else's rules and you set your own rules. Mm. This is the way of, of working out what your rules should be yeah. as opposed to playing by somebody else's rules. Yeah, yeah. Now, just uh, uh, again, this is probably the last one. I promise the last one. Um, when People are eliminating, uh, if you can highlight the, you see, you see your yeah. mouse, uh, the star performance, animal show um, concessions. Um, obviously, there's going to be some reaction from uh, the, the, yep. the, the buyers. Yep. So, um, how do we minimize the, that risk uh, of people are yep. being, uh, you know, hating that you reduce okay. all those things? I'll be, I'll be honest with you, the, that's, that's the thing where sometimes people have to accept that you're going to lose some customers. Right. So, I so like often that. if you if you're eliminating some of this stuff, this is, can often be legacy stuff. This can be something you know. We've got this product and it has these features, and we've got a bunch mm. of clients on mm. there that do that. And then when you really drill in down to it, it's it's you know one percent of one percent of the revenue and the yeah. customer base. But nobody wants to. They've been loyal customers for a long time, mm. so nobody wants to cut them loose, etc. So the, that that can be a tough decision. Uh, but often, often, it's it's holding you back. Yeah. Um, we've had clients who've identified here that you know a third of their business is being caught of their time and effort is being caught up with customers that are unprofitable for them. But right. they're keeping them because they think the cash flow is important to the business, yeah. and they don't realise if they stop wasting their time on there and reinvest that time in opening up the more mm. profitable, uh, you know, customers then they would be growing rather yeah. than just being stagnant. And I guess this is why we have a lot, a lot, lot of the other tools. This is not the only tools. We, we, when we yeah. spoke with clients, we uh, take them through the, the, the rest of the tools. The six part is very important. Yeah. Uh, and also the ERRC, that as we mentioned, uh, how we actually, again, eliminate and reduce is important, yeah. but at, yeah. as, as it's important is create and, yeah. and raise. But I'll give you a couple of other points. Your, your point about the eliminate, um, the, you know the 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 custom. You know how do you, how do you minimise the damage to those customers? So sometimes you just have to accept that you're going to have to leave those customers behind. 
Well, we've had other, some, some clients do is package those customers up into a group mm. and literally hand them over or even sell them as a, as a, as a, a, a group oh, of customers yeah. to a competitor or someone mm. else who's happy in that space, or operating in that space. Or even uh, break it out into a separate business and say, yeah. well, a couple of guys, you guys go do that over and there. And cater for their needs. Yeah, that's right, that's right. So yeah. whatever, but there are ways of sort of separating that yeah, exactly. rather than just cutting those customers off at the knees, right? Mm. Um, so there are things like that that you can do. Um, but also, it's a matter of educating the customer as well, because a number of them will look at that and say, well, yeah, but we've always done that. They'll do the same thing. We've always done it that way. Mm. And then you say, but, but here's the new way of doing it. Mm. And you might have to figure out how you transition them, but some of them will never give it up. Right. Um, but those, to be honest, well, you have to, the, one of the big parts of the blue ocean is you have to accept that you're going to be moving out of the red ocean. Those are the red ocean customers. Mm. The blue ocean customers are the ones that want the, the focus, you to focus on that create and raise side mm. of things. Yeah. They don't care about that stuff. Yeah, yeah. And, if, and they're going to be more profitable up there. So if you have to leave those behind, that's the decision you're going to make. And that's sometimes the hardest decision. Right, I'm, I'm going to ask you to leave it at that because I want to make room for uh, uh, future webinars uh, where we take uh, talk into more details the, the other stuff as well. Andrew, uh, thank you very much for thanks, coming thanks, thanks uh, for today. Me, thanks for letting me talk so much. <laughs> no, we, we enjoy listening. Um, if you have questions, uh, pop into uh, the, the, the comment box or the message box um, or visit um, my website, accolatecoaching.com.au or Blue Ocean Strategy Australia, no space, no hyphens. Dot com dot au. That's it. Um, Just it, search Blue Ocean Strategy Australia and you'll find yeah, us. Yeah, Google it and we're, we're popular. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you very much and hope, hopefully you can uh, join us again in our next webinar. See ya. Thanks.